And so this lesson is entitled The Spread of Byzantine Culture into Kievan Rus. And this is part two of a two-part series on Eastern Europe in the post-classical period. Now I want to start with some interesting comparisons here between Byzantium, Islam, and China within period three of world history. They both pick up um, an idea that wouldn't come until much later, and that's the idea of core states and periphery states. Now, this is a modern idea, but we see the origins of it clear back in period three of world history, right? Core states such as Byzantium, Islam, and China are more sophisticated. They have more STEM capabilities. They're bigger. They're very often older, and they're more connected to the world network. The exception to this being Islam, which was a very young civilization in period three. But the, all the other uh, characteristics hold true. And then periphery states are usually smaller, they have less STEM capabilities, and they're often brought into the world network by core states, and they're highly influenced by those core states. Um, so North Africa and West Africa and parts of East Africa become periphery states to Islamic civilization at this time period. Um, also in period three, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam become periphery states to China's Song and Tang dynasties. And finally, uh, North, Northern and Eastern Europe, um, the forerunners of modern day Ukraine, Georgia, um, Poland, and Russia are periphery states to the Byzantine Empire. And we still see that as we look at Russian and Eastern European culture more generally. We can see the influences of Byzantium and Greece much more than we see the influences of Rome and uh, in the Roman Empire. Right? And part of this took place, part of this happened because of early missionary efforts um, that the Byzantines undertook in you know, northern and eastern Europe. Right. In 864 CE, the Byzantine government sends Cyril and Methodius to monks north to the Balkans and then into southern Russia. And St. Cyril uh, was, is often credited as being the founder of the alphabet known as Cyrillic. Right? When he came to the Russians, they didn't have a written alphabet for their language. Part of his efforts to Christianize them was an effort to make them literate give them an ability to read. So he developed a set of characters that are similar to both the Latin and Greek alphabet. Um, you know, so we look at some of the characters here. You know, the P looks very much like a row, and the C and T, these all look very much like Latin characters, but this is very much a Greek character. Um, as is, you know, the P for pi down here. Oops. Okay, so we can see, you know, a mix of Roman and Latin characters, as well as characters that don't really exist in either language. Um, but that this, you know, as we know from previous lessons, literacy is very important to organizing civilization. And Saint Cyril, uh, you know, brought this to the Russians and the other peoples of the area. Um, and, you know, really what the Byzantines wanted to do was spread their culture through Christianity and literacy to bring the Russians and the Ukrainians and the other tribes of the area, the Bulgarians, the Hungarians, into their sphere of influence and make them periphery states. Um, you know, one of the things that the Byzantines did that was different from the Roman Catholics and the Roman Empire was that they had local languages used in their religious services. This is very different from Roman Catholicism where all religious services had to be done in Latin. So this created a looser connection between the Byzantines and the people to the north in comparison to the Western Romans and the, you know, their connections to the Germanic peoples to their north. And this expansion of Byzantine culture into, you know, northern and eastern Europe creates a cultural border. And, you know, when we read from Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, he does talk about this, that there is a cultural border that is primarily religious that exists right here. And it really is the old border of the Byzantine lands and the Western Roman 
or Roman imperial lands, right? So this is the Western Roman Empire. This is the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire. And it, a lot of this has to do with language and religion and those older political divisions. Some of them stretching all the way back to the period of Greece. Um, you know, so we see, you know, the roots of the difference here. And this is going to become very important because as we see here, this is also the old Soviet Union border, but all these states in here were the so-called Eastern Bloc countries or Warsaw Pact countries that lined up with Russia. And then the Western states, Western nations, tended to line up with the United States and Great Britain. I know that Germany and Britain and France were at war in the World Wars, but once the Cold War begins after World War II, um, Germany is very much connected to, um, I'm sorry, let me back that up a second, West Germany, there used to be a country called West Germany, um, was connected with obviously Western Europe. East Germany was connected with the Soviets, the Russians. So, you know, these borders still have a, a very real power in modern day Europe and in modern day world affairs. Right, and so the Eastern Kingdoms here, you know, Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, Serbia, you know, again, these were very much connected to, you know, the Byzantines and the Eastern Orthodox Church, and then the Western Kingdoms here, very much connected to the Roman Catholic Church and the older Roman ideas, as well as, you know, Latin and things like that. So, you know, uh, and these are, you know, all still very important countries within Eastern Europe. We don't think about them as much in the United States as we do about Western Europe, but they are still major players within the politics of the region. Now part of the spread of Byzantine culture involved the Jewish diaspora, and the word diaspora just literally means spreading, right? Um, you know, at this time period the Jews were displaced from the Holy Land first by the Romans and then later by the Arabs when they invade the area. And, and so they, we see that they're pushed out. And so here's a map of the diaspora. And we see the spread of Jews all the way through Southern Europe and into Western Europe. And they start to set up communities all throughout here. Um, and, and they often faced very, very bad treatment by Western Europeans. They were barred from owning land and farming. And so very often they turn towards education and banking. And an interesting thing is that they were the people, especially in Western Europe, who could loan money at interest. Christians were forbidden uh, to loan money at interest. And so the, this very often fell on the Jews. And then very often when people would owe the Jews a lot of money, they would become very violent with them um, because that was just easier than paying them off. And then, you know, the Jews were very often pushed out of or expelled, that doesn't just happen at school, right? Expelled from cities within Europe and kind of pushed around constantly, right? And that's something modern Americans tend to forget is that the Holocaust was not invented by Hitler and that kind of anti-Jewish action was not invented by the Germans. It had gone on for thousands of, for at least a thousand years and longer in parts of Europe, all over Europe, not just Germany, but Spain, England, France, Russia. But it had this interesting effect. You know, I've been talking about affinity networks as a part of period three of world history. This set up an affinity network throughout Europe as Jews would get pushed from place to place they would develop connections all over Europe in ways that very often Christian Europeans didn't have because they tended to stay home in their own communities. And so uh, this affinity network benefited Eastern Europe despite the oppressions that the Jews faced. Uh, again, their high levels of education and wealth because of banking, you know, allowed them to, you know, well, enabled Eastern European to grow by their influence. Now, one of the the, the first um, you know major player to come out of the growth in this region at the time was what is so called Kievan Rus. Um, now, Kiev is the capital of modern day Ukraine, and so this these lands were part kind of part Russian, part Ukrainian, um, and and the people who settled in this area were Indo Europeans from Central Asia, so they'd come over. You know, these are the old horse people, and they mixed with the native Bulgar peoples, 
and migrated south into the plains of southern Russia and Ukraine. And here, they did have iron weapons. Um, they were animists and they were non-literate people, kind of a tough nomadic people, um, you know, very similar to the Indo-Europeans that um, were very powerful in this area before the rise of the Western and Eastern Roman empires. And so they were firmly entrenched in this area when the Byzantines started to expand. Another important group in this time period were the so-called Norsemen. Now you probably think it think of them as Vikings, that's the term that we tend to use nowadays, but at the time they were known as Norsemen or Normans. And beginning in the 6th and 7th centuries, these Scandinavian raiders, and this is Scandinavia right here, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, uh, the Finns to a smaller degree, I mean this, these are Beowulf's people. they start to spread down and they take advantage of Eastern Europe's river networks and eventually reaching as far south as Constantinople there were very rich trade networks along the river lines here um, into the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea and so you've got these Vikings sailing as far south as almost the Mediterranean and they set up city-states like Kiev right Kiev was originally a Viking town uh, in fact, the legendary first prince of Kiev, a man named Rurik, was himself a Dane from Denmark. Again, the same place where Rothgar's people are from and where Beowulf is fighting Grendel, if you believe that legend. Right? In fact, the word Russia may come from a Greek word for the red hair of the Norse invaders who came down from the north. Uh, perhaps this explains why the Russians and the Ukrainians are such tough people, is they all that Viking blood in them. But uh, they had a huge influence on this area because they started to settle uh, these areas and created more permanent communities than what the original um, Eastern, I'm sorry, Central Asian um, tribes had done previously. Right, and the princes of Kiev, you know, they start to integrate themselves into this Byzantine core civilizational philosophy, right, in nine. Uh, from 980 to 1015, Vladimir I was the prince of Kiev. He converted the kingdom to Christianity, right? And he did this by converting himself. And this is a very common thing in European history. Once the king converts, all his people are expected to convert. And that was not uh, an easy thing for Vladimir. I mean, he held mass baptisms and in some places forced conversions, literally threatening, threatening people's lives if they didn't convert to Christianity. Um, and this also created the Russian Orthodox Church, which uh, started under the control of Kiev and was very similar to Eastern Orthodox Christianity, but had um, some different Russian features to it. Then 1019 to 1054, Yaroslav the Wise sets up a legal system with courts, and he also began to translate religious literature into Slavic. So kind of similar to what we see here in West Africa, you know, you've got common language, common legal system, common culture, you have the affinity network with the Byzantines, and this helps set up a more complex civilization in Eastern Europe under the control of Kiev, right, go Ukraine. And Kievan culture and politics, as I said, was heavily influenced by Byzantine, Byzantium and Orthodox Christianity, right? Its language was Cyrillic. It used icons within church ceremonies. Now, icons are these little um, paintings or statues that are used to help people kind of connect to God. The, uh, the Western, the Roman Catholics had no business with that. They felt it was idolatry. But it was at the core of Orthodox and Russian Orthodox Christianity. You start to see a growing landed aristocracy at this time period where, you know, warriors are starting to settle down and farm. And they had a system of free peasantage here that, um, you know, really benefited the people on the ground. But as all empires do, again, this is a big theme in this unit, what causes empires to decline, um, the Mongols um, or the so-called Tatars, which is my favorite name in all of world history, right? The, the Russians called the Mongols the Tatars, right? The people of hell. Their invasions, um, you know, took down the Russian and Kievan uh, governments 
and uh, the Mongols controlled, but they, they kind of ruled in name only. They're very loosely, distantly in control of these far western lands of their empire, um, but their tr trade in, among the Russians and the Norsemen declined because it was controlled by the Mongols. And so over time, because the Mongols centered their power at Moscow, um, you know, power within this, you know, Russian-Ukrainian area shifted northwards to Moscow. And eventually when uh, the princes of Moscow defeated the Mongols and pushed them out, Moscow, which is of course is in modern day Russia, became the center of power in this region. And this is, begins the process by which the Russians start to dominate the Ukrainians. So the long-term um, impacts of the decline of Kiev and Rus, um, power in Europe is going to begin to shift westward towards France, Italy, and England. Part of this was because of the decline of Rus. Part of this was because of uh, the growing organization of the Europeans, as well as some STEM improvements they made. You know, and Russia's geographic isolation from seaports has always been a challenge, right? Russia's coastal seaports freeze up in the winter, and without southern seaports on the Black or Caspian Sea, the Russian economy would suffer every winter. Um, and it was, you know, kind of landlocked. It didn't have access to the oceans, which is going to help places like Italy and Spain and Portugal and France and England once power starts to shift across the Atlantic and the New World begins to be colonized. And like I said, the Mongol invasions kept Eastern European Eastern Europe under siege and backwards for centuries. Uh, the Mongols were not a very advanced civilization in terms of their STEM capabilities and their abilities to develop you know, large civilizations. And then as we've looked at before, once Byzantium collapses and falls to the Turks in 1453, and of course the Turks are Muslim, that really isolates both you know, Kiev and Rus and Rus Russia more generally. Um, and so this is going to explain the roots of the power imbalance between Western and Eastern Europe that will extend all the way into our day and age. And so that's it. Thanks for watching.